Uh, yeah, so I'm Clyde. I, I'm a second year PhD student at uh, Imperial College London uh, in the computational photochemistry group. And I've been trying to convince uh, my peer group and various other people to, to join the Python world. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what, what that means. I mean, I guess we've heard a lot about how to use big data and all the processes you can use. I guess I'm going to talk more about how you can set sources of closed data free. I mean, I'm, I'm working in a world where they're really shut down. I'm trying to uh, make them more, more open to the kind of techniques we, we've heard today. So, yeah, I guess I'm going to talk a bit about what quantum chemistry is, what tools we use, why I think there are problems with our current tool sets, what Python can bring to the table, um, building an IPython notebook that you can use for quantum chemical research, uh, and then some conclusions. Uh, so what's quantum chemistry? Well, we've known since 1929 fundamental laws of nature sufficient to compute uh, any of the properties of matter that we might want to compute. Uh, so Dirac famously made this, this st statement towards that effect. Um, so wh what are the equations we're trying to solve? Well, they're it's called the Schrödinger equation, and it's not appearing there. Good, good. But if it <laughs> if Mathsax was working, it, it would would appear here. So uh, in the classical in classical physics, we can compute, uh, say, how atoms, uh, how planets move around themselves in the sun by solving Newton's laws, and we can do the equivalent in quantum mechanics to, to specify all the different states of, of an electron moving around some set of nuclei by by solving the Schrödinger equation, uh, and we can do that. Uh, analytically in the case of a small system like hydrogen and th that can give us uh, say these kinds of plots which tell us where the electron can be distributed around a single atom uh, and we can do that with just pen and paper. The problem comes if we want to go beyond a single atom very quickly we, we hit problems uh, because we can't solve the, uh, the equations and the end of Dirac's uh, sentence is then after he says we can solve everything already, he goes, it therefore becomes desirable that approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics be developed, which can lead to an explanation of the main features of complex atomic systems. And since then, the, the majority of research in this field has been towards constructing these approximate methods so we can compute answers accurately enough to, um, well, to, to be chemically or, or physically useful. Um, so we've done quite a lot since 1929. So back then, you could compute, I mean, a, a diatomic molecule if, if you uh, push yourself, whereas no nowadays, uh, you can do quite a lot. I mean, this is a bit of a cheat, but it, it looked pretty cool, so I decided to put it up anyway. So this is a mixture of a classical and uh, a quantum uh, simulation, and it spans uh, 200 proteins, which is 10 million atoms. So it's not entirely quantum, but they, they are coupling the, the chromophores, which are the light-sensitive parts of these proteins, together and treating them uh, quantum mechanically, which is an astonishing change considering, well, compared to what we could do in the 1930s. I mean, it's like a, being able to simulate a football and then going to being able to simulate um, the O2 arena. So... So, yeah, we've developed many different methods to do this because it's, it's a pretty uh, uh, old field. Uh, and they break down into different ways of turning the equations into different equations that are uh, simpler, and then different numerical approximations of those simplified equations. And combined together, there are many, many different ways to do this, and there's a lot of different choice. Uh, and that's kind of built into a lot of different programs. I mean, th there are new programs being built all the time, but some of the biggest that are used uh, today are stuff that began life in the 60s. And this is a tiny subsection of them. They just happen to be uh, the ones compatible with a, a library I'm going to use later. Um, and yeah, in, in academia, at least in, in the field that, that I work in, it's the large ones in the 1950s that dominate, primarily because the number of man years of development that's gone into them mean that they have more methods and they can do more properties than, than other, other codes. Uh, and that's great, but the problem is that they're designed with a mindset from another era. Uh, I mean, that they're completely out of touch, in certain respects, they're completely un out of touch with, with our, our modern uh, tool set. I mean, I in fact, if you look at the source code, as I have, y you still see it's, it's written in Fortran 77 as if it's being computed on punch cards, and it's littered with go-to statements and other things that make modern computer scientists cry. Um, 
So yeah, th th that's the code itself. And when it comes to running these things, uh, well, wh what people do is that they write text files out. You know, they, they, and they can be simple. I mean, this case is just uh, two two atoms, uh, a dimer, and it's choosing, uh, it's specifying the coordinates and it's specifying the method and how much computer power to use. Uh, and that's not so bad. But it can also be evil. I mean, you can have to specify horrible machine codes that y you have to look up deliberately. Um, I mean, you have to consult people for. You need to specify numerous parameters for thousands, or in some case, hundreds of thousands of atoms. Uh, I mean, that's what, what's going on there. Then they specify the connectivity between all the atoms, uh, parameters for force fields you're going to use. I, if you had to do this by hand, it would be almost impractical, well, impractically impossible. And um, fortunately, there are some tools to do this, but uh, and without them, you wouldn't be able to do some of these calculations. But they're really imperfect tools. Uh, they, they're incomplete. They don't cover all the functionality you, you could use the program for. The closed source, or th the most effective and commonly used ones, are closed source. They're not extendable. They're not scriptable. Uh, and they cost a lot of money. So we should be doing better than this in, in, in 2014. Uh, and, and yeah, th though the, the programs themselves, I mean, in, in the case of the, the main ones, they have decent documentation. Certainly Gaussian, which is the one I'm going to talk about, there are lots of clever uh, machine codes you can put in to, to make your calculations more effective, but there's the documentation doesn't exist. I mean, the only way to find out how to do this stuff is to go and apprentice with some one, one of the old gurus who knows how, and then you, know, you try and do tasks for them in the hope that they give you the secret knowledge to, to do the calculations you want to do. So, yeah, well, this is this is great. I mean, this is a, a schematic and its details are unimportant, but I was handed this when I started my PhD and it was like how to do one calculation on a protein uh, and it's all like use this program to prepare this part and then take the input file and edit it by hand and then copy this bit from this other, it's like six different programs and hand it, it's, it's crazy. Um, so once you have your, you've created your input file, you, you submit it to a, to a cluster and, and away it goes. And what you get back is, in fact, another text document which is as difficult to, to cope with as the input file. In that it, it's basically the, the debug output of, of the code whilst it's running. It prints out all manner of different details. Um, at, I mean, this is a small section of it. It doesn't look too bad, but it, it's completely non-standard. So, so, for instance, if you want to calculate the energy of, of a, a set of molecules and you use one method. You might think if you use another method, it's going to be in the same place and be the same line. No, 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 it's not. It's going to be somewhere completely different. It's going to look completely different. You're, you know, the st string you're going to grep for one is not going to work for the other. I if you're lucky, you won't be able to grep. You know, if you're lucky, you can grep it. If you're not, you're going to have to write a custom org script to pull it out. Um, so, yeah, th there is a bit of machine readable data in, in these things at the end, but it, it's incomplete. Uh, and there is also another machine readable output, um, which is its own close, it's, it's, its own separate uh, format, but it's reasonable. Um, you can turn it into, you can read it pretty easily, but it doesn't actually include all the information. You can't, you can't get away from these hideous log files. Um, so, so yeah, that's what people do. They, they, they build these things in, in a complicated tool chain. They, sometimes you can visualize a small amount of the data with the GUI, but generally people will either open the things and copy and paste into Excel the, the calculation data they want, or if they're sophisticated, they'll write custom bash or shell scripts for their individual use cases. Uh, so yeah, th this is kind of the workflow that, that they, they adopt. They, they build their molecule, they build their input file, they build the job script to submit it to the cluster, they submit it to the cluster, they look to check if everything's okay. If it's not, they change something. I, if it, it looks okay, then they, they apply their custom script to pull out the data, which they then you know, use to, I don't know, some, some plotting like, really like XM Grace or new plot to, to plot. Um, and it, they don't have any real, well, the, the, there's no standard way to have a record of what you do. People have their own ways of keeping notes. But on, on numerous occasions, people will come back to previous calculations that worked and, and not keep track of this process, that this iterative process they use to figure out how to make a calculation work is, well, if they're, if they're good, they document as they go, but there's no standard way to do this. Um, so, and, and that ref that's reflected in, in the literature. So when people report the calculations, they normally report uh, you know, the, the output of this iterative process. So they make the calculation work and they give you an overview of how the kind of commands they've done, but if you want to come and reproduce it yourself, there can be lots of hidden gotchas that they don't include little machine code changes they or li little IOP codes they put in or something that meant their initial calculation failed and they did all this extra stuff, but you don't know about that because they haven't included it in the literature. And they haven't included, sometimes you get input files, more, more likely you get a load of 
strings. You get a load of text files with some, some numbers representing structures. Um, so, yeah, I have a lot of problems with this. I think it's a really inefficient process. I think the exchange of information through the literature is really low bandwidth. So there's no reason we can't get all of the, this process they've used. We can't have all the information that they've, they've gone through. Um, and, and I think it really limits the usage of, of the kind of calculations we can do because you make people go through all this pain to do a single calculation. So there could be all kinds of interesting ways to combine quantum chemistry with other fields that's massively limited because we just can't plug stuff together very easily. So how can Python help? Well, we can, we can sort this out with, with a glue language like Python. We can replace these medieval practices of writing elaborate text files and, uh, and reading aneurysm-inducing output files. Uh, and we can run all of our calculations, if we wrap it in this way, I inside a notebook. And that way, we've got a kind of curated store of our, our research process, uh, which we can, we can share with other people. Um, so, so that's what, what uh, um, a lot of other people have been involved with, and, and, and I have too. So I'm going to talk about some of the, the libraries I'm going to use, uh, mostly this, this ASC, which is this atomic simulation environment, which these guys in, in Denmark have set up to try and to do this and to, to combine a lot of these Avanitio codes in a way that can be talked to in a systematic manner, uh, and cclib, which is a, a passing library. So you combine these two, you can get most of, of what we want, which is a quantum chemical API. Um, so the atomic simulation environment I I is written by this, was constructed by this group in Denmark and is slowly being used more. You can define um, atoms, objects in a, in a reasonably uh, sensible way. And um, yeah, so here I'm, I'm defining a nitrogen dimer, um, just specifying the positions and, and the, the molecule itself. And you can build a crystal from a, from a lattice. So I'm building a copper uh, uh, FCC cluster, telling it uh, how big it is and putting a slab of vacuum on, on the top. Uh, and you, or you can read from structures you, you've created or you've downloaded from, from a structure database. Um, so then once you have your, your object, you can attach one of the calculators that's been uh, implemented and you can use that to do calculations. So behind the scenes, it's sending off stuff to whichever calculator you've asked. A really basic one is this, this EMT, which is from their tutorial, and it's only implemented energy and forces, but the more sophisticated ones implement m many more methods. Uh, and then you can use it to compute energies or to do other more interesting things. I mean, the philosophy tends to be to write small scripts that make use of the calculators to uh, compute specific properties, and then ASC's own machinery is used for like optimization. So in this example, that they're going to compute uh, a slab of copper and calculate the energy, and then then a nitrogen molecule and calculate the energy, and then they stack the nitrogen on top of the copper. They freeze the copper, they run an optimization to lower the energy, which kind of relaxes the copper, uh, the nitrogen onto the copper surface, and then they, they take the difference in energy, so they get the absorption energy. Um, and they don't have to do it by hand, and they have this, this, nice, this nice way of doing it. Um, and the cclib is uh, a library for passing. It's been implemented uh, since 2008, and th they have a lot of the major codes uh, that you can just... Yeah, you can just slot, slot it into their parser and they handle lots of the, all the horrible use cases that, that uh, all the horrible formats that, that, get, that the, the uh, legacy codes give you. And they're constantly, of course, having their parsers broken because the, the, these people don't really cooperate. They just change it randomly. But there's enough of a community going that they fix it. So usually your parsers are working. Uh, and then you, yeah, you have your, your format in a, in a nice uh, an array or some other um, machine-readable format. Um, uh, finally, uh, the, there's uh, another toolkit uh, which has been developed in, in Belgium, and their focus is on manipulation of uh, an analysis of molecular data rather than construction of files. And there's a lot of overlap between uh, lots of these little libraries, so that there's no, not yet a unifying uh, uh, infrastructure, but they cover a lot of functionality, and if you plug them together with bits of glue, you, you can do a lot. Um, so in this case, they're, they're defining a molecular graph. So how you're going to bond your atoms together, given that you only have uh, positions of atoms. Um, they also have some the parsers for the machine-readable components of the specialized machine-readable file. So plugging this all together kind of gives me uh, an overall API. And then, of course, the IPython notebook, I want to run it inside that. I guess you guys all know what that is. Um, uh, and then there are visualization libraries. Uh, yeah, JMOL is a nice visualization library that's written in, in JavaScript. So you, you can have your, your molecules sitting nicely in your, your notebook. You can visualize uh, electrons or, or the molecular structures themselves or vibrations. 
um, which is great. Um, it's cool. Spins, amazing. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then, so the, uh, the glue code I, I, I was trying to add to this is just a way of uh, operating over SSH because I want to run calculations from inside uh, a notebook somewhere away from the cluster, and I want it to handle it itself. When so when I tell it to go calculate some property, it's going to go away. It's going to submit stuff to the cluster, and it's going to give me back the answer. So in order to do that, that's a slightly change in the in the usage uh, of some of these libraries. I picked up Paramico and, and PBS library, uh, and I basically stuck them together in, into some glue with some, some JavaScript. So, yeah, t so in the combination, we can make this quantum chemical API, and by using the notebook, we can kind of create this kind of curated research output that could be shared really effectively with other people. Um, so what does it look like? Well, it kind of looks like this. We, we import the, the, the whole thing, and we can, we can run stuff dynamically um, fr from where we are. So I'm, I'm reading in a, a molecule of uh, graphene in this case, I specify the methods I want to use and the amount of uh, cluster space I want to use. Uh, and then, uh, then I submit the calculation. Uh, and I do it with two different variants because I'm interested in what's happening. When I get back, it is a kind of uh, a table that looks like this, telling me what, what succeeded and what's not. Uh, and in the actual thing, I, I can, I mean, because I'm in this HTML slides, I can't click on these things. But when, if I want to look further into the, the actual output, I can link it to any number of different programs. I can link it to just an editor or, or some other program to, to analyze the, the individual data uh, itself. But most importantly, I have all of it in a, in, a, in a format that I can access. I can loop over, I can, I can send it to something else. I can collect a million of these calculations and then send them to, to one of the libraries or one of the techniques we've, we've seen today. Um, so yeah, it's just a, a, a dipole moment, so a charge um, distribution. Um, so yeah, you can use it to do in, in one step what, what one of the previous, uh, what that previous optimization step with ASC t took the script because we have wrapped the whole of the, the calculator, we're not using any of the, the internal machinery, we can do it in just, just one line. Um, and, and most importantly, you can do like really complicated stuff or, or stuff that would be a real hassle to do if you were writing stuff out. So wh what I want to do here is I want to um, take uh, a reaction between two molecules. I want to find how it's going to react and then take sequences, snapshots along this, and for each snapshot, compute some vibrational property and, and then plot that. Now, if I had to do that by hand, well, I could write out the first two calculations by hand, but then I'd have to wait for the output to, I'd have to read through the, the output and, or write a custom script for this particular use case, pull it all out, individually put it in different files, run those individually. It, it's a pain, whereas in this format, it's really simple. I can just, I, I just define them sequentially, and then I can loop over the subsequent uh, snapshots and run the new calculations, and yeah, in, two, in, I mean, in eight lines or so, I have done everything I want to do. Uh, and then, yeah, then I can plot it, because I have, I have it. Um, this is one of the vibrations along these snapshots. So it just makes life uh, much easier. Um, you can also do things like mi mix quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, and this can also be a pain. You can't really do this without one of the GUIs, because it has to work out a lot of things on the fly, like how, when you tell it to cut stuff up, to take a molecule and to use the center and treat that uh, quantumly, the rest classically. A lot has to be worked out to pass, um, it's like how it, they two connect together to pass uh, onto the underlying calculators. And we can do that again in Gaussian and make it uh, in, in Python and make it nice and easy to do. Um, yeah, so, and it generates files for us that, that then it then passes on. Um, yeah, and, and rather than having to read through 24 to 21,000 lines of output, we can just use our Python. Uh, so at the moment, yeah, I can run a reasonable subset of Gaussian, I'm working on that, and extract almost all of the, the data from it, view and manipulate the, the structures, and we have an API. Uh, what I'd like to do is to extend the, the uh, construction calculations to that full proteins, which was that long uh, set of... Uh, well, the thing I got handed that takes three days, I want it to take three minutes, and hopefully it will. Uh, and I also want to, to extend the notebook so that we can use it as, a, as this curated uh, research uh, framework. So, so I, wa I want to have uh, what amounts to a dashboard for the notebook with nodes connected together, where each node represents some, um, some, some part of your research. So calculations uh, that lead on one from another, and then go through to analysis and then some kind of uh, final uh, 
output that you want to report, but also the dead ends, the stuff that didn't work. Uh, so then if someone has this, that they can see what you've done. They can, they can really, there's no problem to reproducing your calculations if they can really see what you've done and why you've done it. And they get a lot of, the informa in, they get a lot of information out of this, and it, I think it would speed up a lot of... Um, yeah, a lot of the research we're doing. So I'm hoping to write my thesis as a kind of set of these linked uh, project trees, one for each chapter. And yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. So uh, many thanks to my supervisor and uh, the EPAS RC and the people who've already built most of this stuff. And uh, I'll take any questions if there are any.